dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the solemnity that we celebrate today is traditionally referred to with this succinct but deceptively rich title, the Annunciation or the Annunciation of the Lord, which is told in the gospel, which we just heard, recounting the Archangel Gabriel's delivery of a message from God to Mary. There's so much implied in the words of today's gospel reading that if we unpack it, we can see that out of this event are fashioned numerous feast days and solemnities. For instance, the Archangel Gabriel, he's mentioned in scripture not only here, but in other places, along with Michael and Raphael. And so we have the solemnity of the angels, the holy angels on September 29th, the archangels Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael. In this same passage, we also heard that there was a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph, and the virgin was Mary. Well, we just celebrated last week the, the solemnity of St. Joseph, the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and earlier in January, we celebrated the espousals of the Blessed Virgin Mary with Joseph on the 23rd of January. The way in which Gabriel greets Mary also recalls another Marian solemnity. When he calls her full of grace, it's not just a descriptive uh, greeting or a way of praising her, but it's a title, full of grace, a title which can only apply to one in whom there is no trace of sin. And so with this greeting, we also have the truth of the Immaculate Conception, which we celebrate with great solemnity on the 8th of December. And we also recall on February 11th, during the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, where we remember her identification of herself to Bernadette with the words, I am the Immaculate Conception. And of course, in relation to Mary, the Annunciation primarily is a declaration of her divine maternity. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. Most High is the title of God. So Gabriel's message could also be paraphrased as, you will become the mother of God's son. And we know that Jesus, the son of God, the second person of the most holy trinity, is God also, as well as our Savior, as well as the son of Mary. He is God, and so rightly we call Mary the mother of God. And we celebrate that as a solemnity on the first day of every year, on New Year's Day, the 1st of January. In the way that Mary responds to the angel, we learn that she will conceive virginally. To Gabriel's announcement, she replies with the question, how can this be since I have no relations with a man? That is a statement of intent. In fact, she has taken a vow of virginity, as has Joseph. It's the only way to explain her words. And so in the Annunciation, we have also a reference to the perpetual virginity of Mary. And there's another reason evident in the exchange and in the words of the angel, the response to her question, which also points to her perpetual virginity. Because Gabriel explains, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. This statement implies that Mary will have a mystical and spousal relationship with the Holy Spirit 
which is why she's given the title spouse of the Holy Spirit. And though she is espoused to Joseph in a real way, the offspring of her virginal womb is not the carnal son of Joseph. And it would be abhorrent to the Hebrew mind and a violation of the law for her to have carnal relations with a man other than the father of her son, who is, in fact, not Joseph, but God. And so as we pray in the Angelus, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit. According to the flesh, she is still a virgin, and as the spouse of the Holy Spirit, will always remain one. So far, all of what we've said primarily involves the two most conspicuous uh, beings referred to or who actually are active in this conversation. We have the angel Gabriel and the human creature, the sinless Virgin Mary. And we have all of this richness that is celebrated throughout the year in various feasts and in the doctrines and dogmas regarding Mary, but conspicuously, if you will, hidden is the main, the main event and the main person who is not even uh, really seen, his entrance is completely hidden. In fact, it's not even directly referred to. And it comes with the second to the last sentence of this reading. And it comes coinciding with Mary's closing words. May it be done to me according to your word. And with that statement, with her manifestation of her consent to the will of God takes place the most pivotal event in all human history. The word was made flesh. It's not stated explicitly here, and we could very easily, if we blink an eye, not see what has happened, but all this conversation is a prelude to this, which is not explicitly mentioned, because right after that it says, then the angel departed from her. It doesn't say Jesus now is present in her womb, but in fact, that is what happens. That's the main action of this uh, passage in the Bible and of this solemnity, but we don't call it the Feast of the Incarnation. We call it the Annunciation. So it's very characteristic of the holiness of God When he comes, as we hear in the Old Testament, it's not with an earthquake, it's not with a fire, it's not with a raging storm, but it's a a small whisper. And Jesus enters into this scene in a most hidden and inconspicuous way. And he comes and he enters the scene because Mary said yes to the will of God. And this is a a lesson for us. The first part of my homily underscores the undeniable importance and centrality of Mary in the history of salvation. The claim of some that Mary is, was simply incidental and just a simple peasant girl whose importance was minimal, just an instrument for the incarnation, uh, is not satisfying when we consider all of these, um, all of the glory that is a result of her being chosen by God and her responding freely to God's plan for her. So, we do see that Jesus is, and his incarnation is really the central uh, 
action of today's gospel reading, but it's, it's very inconspicuous in the way it comes about. It happens without even being acknowledged explicitly. And this is a good indication for a spiritual truth that we all must try to live. We must all, uh, if we wish for Christ to come into our hearts and to allow us to participate in his divine life, then we must be like Mary. Be humble, be willing to accept God's will, even when it may mean the sacrificing of all of our plans, as she was prepared to do. And God gave her something even better. She not only was permitted to continue to be a virgin and to fulfill that vow and wish of hers, but she became also a mother. God will richly, beyond our imagining, reward all of our desires and wishes if we are willing to simply lay down our will and then he will enter the scene, perhaps inconspicuously, but decisively and effectively change everything for us. May the humble handmaid of the Lord and our Queen and Mother and the Mother of God intercede for us to have this grace also, to accept God's will, to let, his, let it be done according to his word in our life. Praise be Jesus and Mary.